Today on the Avenue Podcast, we have the pleasure of welcoming Mark Sultana from DSDG Architecture and Mike Kokoza from Trinity Custom Homes. Glad to have you guys here. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks for having me as well. So let's talk a little bit about how the design and construction process has evolved in the last few years in Florida, namely in the Sarasota area, um, largely due to hurricanes and some of the temperamental weather that we have around. Let's talk a little bit about what both of your companies do, and then we can get into a little bit more of the, uh, the granular details about how this has all evolved. Okay. Um, Mark Sultana, I'm principal architect at DSTG Architects. Uh, we've been working with Trinity for I'm not even sure how many years now, but excellent, excellent contractor. We love uh, the collaboration that we have together. Um, most of the projects we do, I would say actually all of the projects we do, uh, have to meet hurricane regulations dictated by the Florida Building Code. Um, some of them are more severe than others in that um, houses that are constructed uh, directly on beachfront have different standards and different requirements than houses, say, built on a canal, uh, bay, front, or even out east of the interstate. Um, we have different type of uh, wind requirements in all these zones and different type of flood requirements in all the zones. So uh, most of our work is in Florida. We occasionally do projects outside of the state. Uh, but everything we do in Florida is um, uh, meant to meet the Florida building code. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. So, Mike, let's talk a little bit about your company and what Trinity Custom Homes does and maybe how you guys have collaborated in the past. Well, yeah, absolutely. Uh, my name is Mike Kikoza. I'm president of Trinity Construction Design. Um, I was born and raised here in the Sarasota area, operating in the construction industry and um, many different roles, uh, superintendent for other builders, um, ran a carpentry business for a long time and, uh, started Trinity construction in 2010 and have been doing that since, um, we focus, uh, primarily on the luxury custom home market. So, um, most of our projects are in and around the barrier islands, waterfront type projects. So, um, really dealing a lot with the hurricane codes. Most of the state of Florida, you're dealing with uh, hurricane codes, but uh, really steps up a few levels uh, as you get into the barrier islands and waterfront type properties, as Mark had mentioned, for uh, the different wind zones, higher wind velocity, and then also the uh, different uh, flood zones and scour and those types of things. So let's talk a little bit more about these codes. They've obviously evolved over the years. How has that created a new implication on the design side as well as on the construction side? Well, I think the biggest implication is the interpretation on the code. So everywhere we work, the building officials and the FEMA, the local FEMA regulatory um, authorities have different interpretations on the code. You, you ask, well, isn't it the same code? Yes, it's the same code. But um, the different municipalities interpret that code differently. So, uh, for instance, Sarasota County, the city of Sarasota, Longboat Key, um, Anna Maria, Holmes Beach, Manatee County, city of Brainton, they are all different authorities that dictate the code and interpret the code differently. Interesting. So can it's we go fun. into, I, I can imagine. So that means <laughs> that your team has to have proficiency with the different interpretations of the code for all these different areas. So how does that as an architect affect how your team works based on where they're actually designing a project? Well, it helps that we have experience in all these areas, but I will tell you that sometimes we get surprises uh, from say a new, a, a new uh, employee of one of these municipalities that interprets it differently than the past employees of the last 24 years. And it creates a surprise where we have to redesign a structure to, to meet that new employee's requirements. Mm. So how do those implications affect you on the building side? Uh, you know, I think Mark was being uh, rather polite there. It's, uh, you know, really <laughs> a lot of moving targets, you know, and, um, you know, the strange part is in, when we start talking to some of these municipalities, some of these different um, uh, building departments, you know, it's it's not – you'd think it'd be easy to uh, bring them a design, have some initial dialogue and some conversations about uh, what our design intent is going to be. 
Um, but it typically doesn't go that way. I mean, are you experiencing that? It's, it, it's, I find a lot of times you have some opening conversation with them and, um, and it's really, well, just design it and send it to me and we can have a conversation then. So there's a lot of legwork. There's a lot of upfront work and, um, you know, quite frankly, sometimes it seems like there should be some better, um, some better communication, some better collaboration and some of those things. But, you know, Mark and I have been dealing with a project, uh, down on Minnesota key that, uh, one of the um, one of the uh, new employees of the building department had uh, made a determination about uh, what a wall what a wall is, you know, and so this wow. was a a new uh, determination, a new definition that um, you know caused the structural engineer to have to go back and redesign the home uh, three times in wow. order to finally get it through permitting, and so. You know, I certainly understand I'm, you know, I don't want to put myself in, in that individual's shoes because I know that they've got a lot of different people to answer to. And I know it's a, a difficult job, but um, it makes it very difficult for the the process between architect, builder, and client in order to put your best foot forward and, and show up so. with a design that's going to be, you know, accurate up front. And so sometimes that's difficult to explain to our clients. You know, um, but uh, at the end of the day, it's um, it's what we do, and that's what we got to yeah. deal with. So, being that you guys have worked on a multitude of projects together, how is how have you guys found a really good way to make that work when you're dealing with these kinds of obstacles, at least from a governmental standpoint? Um, you know, it's it's great because we'll sit down and have a conversation about you know who's going to be the one to bring the topic up, who's going to be the one to start you know having a conversation with the individual. When there's a when there's a question that arises, you get you know typically the process is you you have a, a, a set of uh, construction documents that goes in for permitting, and then mm -hmm. the building department's got actually multiple different departments. You've got FEMA and you've got zoning. Um, you know, you've got the building. Um, you've got the health department sometimes, uh, not so much on the the, um, uh, the barrier islands and those types of things, but in other projects you do. And so there's a multitude of different plans examiners that need to kind of put their stamp of approval on it. And um, what we find is not all the, not it's not always that all of those individuals will have the opportunity to go through and provide their comments. Sometimes you might get one or two comments, mm -hmm. and then you and then you and then you you're you're assuming that the other individuals have looked at it, and so you you right. know go through and you work with the engineer and the architect, and you get all of the um, the plans revised and you submit, and then the uh, the two other ones who didn't comment previously, then they, they step in and they, chime in. they provide theirs. And so <laughs> then there's, there's multiple rounds here. So it's, it's difficult. We get a lot of questions from our, you know, from our clients, you know, you know, how long do you think the permitting process will take? And well, anywhere from, uh, you know, six weeks to 30 weeks, you know, depending right. on the location of it. But, um, you know, it, working with uh, working with DSDG, they're always very uh, proactive. You know, so mm -hmm. when we when we get these review comments back, uh, typically they're going to us because the the contractor is the one that's submitting for or applying for the permit. So we're the mm -hmm. ones getting the review comments back. Right. So. Um, We'll get those and we'll traditionally try to reach out to the building department and say, hey, listen, we don't want to submit these plans reviews to the architect until everybody has had an opportunity to look of at course. it because we don't want to cause them to do more work than they have to. Um, and then we'll look at them together and uh, we'll either have a Zoom meeting or an in-person meeting and we'll we'll discuss um, you know, what changes need to be made to the plans in order to satisfy mm -hmm. whatever comments the plans examiner are coming up with. And so having the opportunity to look that look at that both from the or from collectively the architectural uh, standpoint, the structural engineer standpoint and ultimately the builders, how we're going to build it. Um, and then a lot of times too, with the interior designer, cause sometimes they're going to have some finish effects, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but it makes it very easy when you've got a relationship with uh, a design team who, um, understands the challenges that you have to deal with and is willing to, to look at it from all sides. Um, you know, all six sides of the cube as it, right. you know, as they say, rather than, um, rather than just saying, Hey, you know, hard nose, this is, this is what it's going to be. And, and, mm -hmm. uh, this is what we're going to do. So that's more on the regulatory side. Mm -hmm. So how has this kind of inclement weather affected the the physical design and the physical construction process? Because I'm sure as we are seeing hurricanes get stronger and stronger, the water's getting warmer, these storms are only going to get worse as the years come. So how have you been mindful on the design side to take this into consideration? Well, um, every structure ends up having a lot more concrete than it did even five years ago. More concrete, more rebar, more reinforcing. Um, and the crazy part is, uh, in Sarasota County, we're just about to get, uh, new flood maps. Mm -hmm. Um, the county is working on, um, accepting the maps that FEMA has provided to them. And believe it or not, most of the flood zones are actually going down. Wow. So, um, I don't know how that works, but you know, I guess we have surprising. to trust the government <laughs> on that one. Um, 
And so, and then when I say they're going down, they're getting less severe mm-hmm. than what we previously had. So yes, that could save a client uh, money in terms of um, how much infor- reinforcing and structure they're putting into the structure. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not making the structure any weaker um, or stronger, but you know we're 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 still following the codes, the same code. Uh, actually, the Florida building code is changing at the end of this year too. Mm-hmm. Right. Nothing too major that I've seen so far, but. Um, uh, you know, minor things. They they pretty much update it every couple mm-hmm. of years. So have you noticed from your clients, maybe the clients that are not originally from Florida that are looking to migrate down here, that their demands may have changed based on the storms, based on what they're seeing on the news in terms of how they want their uh, future properties designed? Uh, yes. I have seen more and more clients asking for uh, concrete roofs, mm-hmm. which um, I think we did our first concrete roof with Mike um, and the Trinity Group out on Longboat Key for a, a client. We finished their house about a year ago. Um, and, but since then, we've done uh, repeated projects with concrete roofs and even concrete um, middle floors. Not really that that makes it any stronger, but you know, some people are more concerned about noise. Say they have a bunch yeah. of kids running around and, um, you know, once you pour a concrete floor in between levels, it creates a sound break between right. those floors. Um, but yeah, a lot more concrete, a lot more demand for concrete roofs, mm-hmm. uh, which people ask me all the time, well, is it stronger? Uh, well, yeah, it's concrete, but right. does it meet the code any more than what a wood roof would? Probably not. It's still, they're both designed to, you know, if it's on a barrier island, 160 mile an hour winds. Mm. So whether it's wood or concrete, still 160 right. mile an hour rating. Right. You're still following the code the same way, whether it's a concrete roof or a wood yeah. roof. Uh, so on your side, Mike, uh, when a client approaches you before they've gone through the design process, uh, similarly, if it's an out-of-town client, how have their demands changed when they're trying to source which builder and they meet with Trinity and they're saying, you know, I want to build my future property. How have their demands changed before they even get to the architect process? Their demands are changing, you know, the, so the first concrete roof that we did, uh, with, with, uh, Mark's team on Longbow Key, that one was, um, the client came to us and essentially had a, had a, had a bad experience with a home up North where, um, they had significant leaking and a a partial roof collapse due to some, um, uh, do some, do some insufficient roofing needs. And so this was their final home and they said, you know, they, they effectively wanted a bomb proof, you know? And so, um, that's why they elected to go with the concrete roof. Uh, the second project that we, uh, did with DSDG that had a concrete roof, that one was, uh, came about because they've got a very large, uh, rooftop entertainment area. And we looked at it and, uh, you know, I started asking the client, um, you know, how many people do you imagine having up on this roof at any given time? And when he started giving this, giving us the numbers, my initial concern started going to deflection in the roof trusses. Mm-hmm. Once you start adding that much load on the top, right. um, and so we start went there. So those two realistically were, uh, more so different reasons other than storms. But the third one that we're getting that's in the design right now, that's going to have a concrete roof that we started talking, uh, to the client about there, they were specifically saying, Hey, listen, we want, you know, a home that's as, as strong as possible. And so, Whereas Mark is accurate that, you know, these homes are designed, whether it's wood roof trusses or whether it's uh, concrete uh, concrete roof, um, is still going to meet the building code. That's 100% accurate. I think that concrete does take it, you know, a notch higher. And, and, and specifically, you get some wind loads on a roof. Um, you're not going to get any kind of flexing of that roof system mm-hmm. or anything like right. that. That could translate to some um, architectural deficiencies, maybe drywall ceilings popping and things mm-hmm. like that because there's some minor movement in there. Um, so I do think that if there's an opportunity where it can be introduced, if you've got a client that's very specific about, Hey, I want to deal with as minimum amount of issues as possible, right. you know, in the event of a storm, um, I think concrete's an excellent option. Um, and you know, it adds some, you know, added value, just like the first right. pro- or second project where you can, um, add some additional people, you know, up on top for, you know, celebrations Absolutely. and things like that. Um, you get some added benefits. It is definitely a cost increase. So, mm-hmm. um, those things need to be taken into consideration. Um, you know, we're working with another client right now that, um, you know, their, their specific needs and demands or, or questions about, uh, the hurricane resilience, resiliency of their, of their potential or future project really came down to insurance, um, Mm -hmm. 
you know, with the amount of insurance companies that are dropping out of Florida and I'm sure everybody's seeing, you know, uh, insurance rate hikes across, uh, across the state. Uh, you know, we just recently started a conversation with a client that, you know, his, his basic understanding was, you know, this home is, uh, most likely, you know, I, there may be a point in the very near future where I've got to self-insure the home. So let's take a real hard look at every single exterior detail of the home. And I want to have some very good conversations with the engineer, uh, the architect about what things we can be proactive about to, you know, minimize potential damages and things like that. Right. Um, so realistically, I think we're going to start seeing more of that, you know, as it comes, you know, as it relates to insurance. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, we've, the, as you said, the insurance companies are really dropping like flies in Florida. Yeah. I and mean, every, I feel like every day we turn on the news and it's another insurance company that's dropped out of Florida. And pretty soon we're going to be left with virtually no, no choices other than self insuring. <laughs> well, I think eventually insurance might get to the point where, you know, self insuring is probably a, you know, a, it's a, more a wash. Cost effective. Yeah. You know, so uh, we'll Absolutely. see how that goes. So in terms of building products, specifically when you're specking out products on a plan, there's a lot of different products that you need to be mindful of, specifically as it relates to hurricanes. So how do you decide which products you spec and what do you look for in the partners that are manufacturing these building products to ensure that the homes you're designing for your clients and the homes that you're building for your clients are up to par with the codes as well as any kind of uh, added safety that a, uh, obviously in the luxury market that a demanding client may want? Sure. Um well, there's the the core of the house or the shell of the house that's pretty standard. It's mm-hmm. uh, we're sticking with concrete block, filled solid with rebar as needed, um, either a wood truss roof or a concrete roof, and then all the windows and doors in the house have to go through a rigorous process of getting what's called an NOA, a notice mm-hmm. of acceptance from the state of Florida, um, which is in a very expensive process for the window and door companies to go through to achieve that rating. Um, then the glass itself is, uh, we, we have a typical standard we use. It's, um, it's an insulated impact low E glass. Mm-hmm. So it's not only providing the protection from the hurricane winds of a two by four shot into it with a cannon <laughs> at 160 miles an hour, um, it also has the thermal protection of being insulated and the low E protection to provide um, uh, UV protection for the house and the finishes inside. But then there's the finished materials, right? Mm-hmm. So not every house is just stucco and paint. Right. Um, I would say stucco and paint is probably 75% of every house we do. But uh, we're doing uh, one with Trinity right now that virtually has almost no stucco. And it has all uh, a wood look uh, siding Mm -hmm. that's uh, manufactured from aluminum. So it's an aluminum product, 20-year warranty that looks like wood, um, but it's not wood. So... The client wanted that kind of warmth in mm-hmm. the design. So we've been using these products for uh, probably 15 years now. Um, and we always have uh, reps coming into our office showing us the new latest and greatest. Oh, it works great in California right. and New York and Canada. But, you know, how does it work in Florida? Because right. it's, a, it's, it's a different, here. yeah, it's a different climate. Right. So, um some people know this, but you know, when the reps come in, I, I have them leave me a sample and I put it out in my garden and <laughs> see how it does after a year before I ever think about specifying it on mm-hmm. a project. But I think that's a testament to your willingness to research that you have the right partners and to really be careful in who you select for your clients. Yeah, absolutely. Your clients. Yeah. So similarly, um, Mike, you know, as you're going through the building process, how do Mark's decisions in the building uh, material partners that he selects, how does that affect you on the construction side? Uh, well, we're going to go through and do some of the same due diligence that that uh, Mark's team is going to do. You know, at the end of the day, it's a, it's a collaboration. We want to be able to uh, make sure that we can stand behind the product we put out, that, that, that we can warranty it. Um, and so there's some good conversation that occurs with Mark. Um, and, you know, additionally, along with the uh, the design of the home, we take a look at a lot of these things. And Mark's got, uh, you know, not only himself, but, you know, the, the staff there is uh, extremely collaborative. We'll look at different ways and how we're going to 
um, tried to keep wind driven rain out of uh, different, you know, window and door openings and those types of things mm-hmm. um, and have some good conversation about how to do that. And, and, and so we'll look at things and, and try to find ways to offer additional waterproofing methods, additional um, uh, safeguards to try to make sure the home is more hurricane um, mm-hmm. ready, prepared, Got you know, it. as it possibly can be. Um, but um you know, at the end of the day, it's, you know, as Mark said, it's, it's important to make sure that the, that the types of finished materials that are being utilized on the home are ones that not only he can stand behind as a specifier, um, but also we can stand behind, um, installing it. And so there's, um, you know, the, the aluminum, uh, the aluminum wood look siding is, is an excellent product. Mm-hmm. And, and, um, the, you know, the tricky part is making sure that all those different products are going to finish off nicely. Right? right. And, uh, so that's where we kind of get into, uh, the details and how those work out. And so we, you know, we have some great details with Mark. There was, um, you know, we wanted to make sure that that aluminum siding ended up flush with stucco, mm-hmm. you know, on a, on a specific instance on a home. And, and so we looked at that and we said, okay, we're going to admit the stucco behind the aluminum siding but um, we need to provide a waterproofing, you know, mm-hmm. a method right. because, you know, concrete block is not waterproof and um, actually stucco is not waterproof either. It's the, it's the paint that you apply over top mm-hmm. of the stucco that's your waterproofing. Right. Um, so we worked to specify, a, you know, a very specific waterproofing that spanned not only behind the stucco, but behind the, behind the uh, metal mm-hmm. and, um, and then install the, uh, the aluminum over top of it and, uh, and still make sure that those finishes uh, came out as best as they possibly could. So the partnership really is important between it the architect is. and the builder, especially in this type of environment where you have to be mindful of these types of, uh, of weather phenomenons. It is. And, you know, I think that, um, I think that's the struggle really between, you know, architects and builders is, um, finding, you know, for, for architects, I would assume finding builders that really care about those details that dig into them and look at them and want them to turn out as nicely as possible rather than just check a box and say, right. okay, that part's done. Let's move on. Let's keep going. You know, right. it's, um, working with a team of people who genuinely care about those details. It's, it's hard to get somebody motivated about those details. Right. You know, you talk about a, like a, like a clean job site. I was listening to a a podcast the other day about, um, about construction and elevating superintendents and training superintendents. And, and the conversation came up about, uh, you know, if, 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 if you walk onto a job site and it's dirty, like that should make your skin crawl. And, you know, you start thinking about like, how do you get somebody to a point where they understand your level of, uh, passion for those types of things. And so, you know, teaching that to your team, those details and make sure everything's going to finish out right is, uh, it's an everyday, uh, everyday challenge, everyday task. Absolutely. Yeah. The details are a complete collaborative. So we spend months laboring over these drawings, but you know, sometimes the connection between two items doesn't work as well as it, you think it works on paper. So, uh, we love having that, uh, collaborative with the contractors we work with where we can, uh, meet them on site. They could show us, Hey, I think this is a better way of doing this. Mm -hmm. I have no problem with that, with that whatsoever. Um, you know, I've been doing this for a long time, but I don't know everything. And, you know, the, that collaborative is so important because Mm -hmm. giving the client the best product and project that we can give them is more important than anything else. Yeah. And to that point, so with all the recent storms that we've had, you know, in 2022 and even so far into 2023, do you ever have some of your customers that you've designed or built a property for that actually reach out to you after one of these storms just to thank you for the type of product that you've actually built for them? Yeah, there's, uh, you know, the one that we did in um, in Longbow Key with the concrete roof, our, our clients, uh, you know, stayed through that storm when uh, Hurricane Ian came and... Uh, you know, it's pretty interesting. They've, you know, they're watching, they're, they're, they're right on Sarasota Bay and the way that the home is facing, they were getting direct wind coming at them for, a, you know, for a long period of time. And, um, you know, they're sitting there watching the, the rain pelt the sliding glass doors and they've got a, they've got a big concrete table, uh, eight or 10 person, uh, dining set outside that, uh, they decided to leave outside. And they said that they sat there and watched that thing lift up in the air, slam against the sliding glass door and then wow. blow sideways across the deck and over top of the railing and out into the yard. And they were astonished that, you know, the sliding glass door suffered no damage and, uh, you know, gave them a real sense of peace and security that, uh, they made right decisions, you know, building where they built and right. that they're comfortable with it. So, um, you know, it's neat to hear those, those kind Absolutely. of stories, you know, I think that's very gratifying, whether it's as an architect or as a builder to hear 
the satisfaction in your work, especially in a time like that. Oh yeah. yeah. That table took, I think like three or four of my guys to pick up and, wow. and move back onto the deck. So to imagine when picking that up and slamming it against the doors, uh, pretty amazing. And so how do you think that the next five years, because Mark, as you mentioned, there's been already pretty significant evolution in many of these different aspects in the last five years. What do you guys think the next five years are going to look like as it pertains to design and maybe on a regulatory side as well as on the building side? Um, you know, I think that, we, you know, Florida had a really big wake up call back when Hurricane Andrew hit. That's when you started to see a lot of these building codes start to really start to increase. Right. Um, and if you look, uh, you know, down south of us after Hurricane Ian went through, um, you know, a lot of the older homes really suffered the worst of it. But, you know, the majority, if not, you know, most of them, I guess it's the majority, um, you know, really fared quite well as far as how they performed during those storms. You mm -hmm. know, everything that, you know, we design with breakaway walls in certain flood zones and to allow uh, floodwaters to to move freely through the home without putting a lot of hydrostatic pressure on the supports of the building. Right. Um, a lot of those homes, you know, the the, the breakaway walls acted as intended. Um, and a lot of those homes did, you know, fairly quite well. There's obviously the you know, the issue where they had, you know, in, in the inability to access the home due to roads being covered with sand and, you know, weeks without power and that type of thing that the residents had to endure. But uh, their main uh, their main investment, you know, suffered, you know, minor, you know, right. financial damages, you know, in the in the overall scheme of the total cost of the home. Um, so I think we're definitely right on the right track, you know, and um, but with anything, um, you know, I think in order for insurance companies to stay in Florida, they're going to lobby for, you know, uh, more stringent uh, building codes. We're going to continue right. to see uh, more and more. And, and you know, I think we're going to continue to see some of the challenges that we're dealing with now where, um, you know, understanding what the um, what the. Um, you know the code and and what they're sorry I'm I'm, I'm having a lack of uh, words here <laughs> but what their what their understanding of the code is or how mm -hmm. they define it you know right. just like we've seen on some of our projects and so that's going to be I think the um, the biggest challenge for us is is how do we how do we deal with all these different building departments and how do we get on the same right. page and and defining what a specific uh, code interpretation may be right. you know um, but I think that we're going to continue to see more more strict it's and more strict. And um, you know, it's, I think it's good for everybody, really. It's good for the homeowner because they're going to have a home that's going to be stronger. You know, uh, hopefully, hopefully if the building codes, you know, get stricter, then, you know, maybe insurance companies will, you know, feel more comfortable uh, insuring those properties. But uh, I don't uh, I don't ever recall a time where building codes, you know, decreased. You right, know, so right. I think it's natural to understand it's going to continue to uh, to get uh, more stringent. Yeah. And customers just have to understand that, you know, with that increase uh, building code and reinforcing and so on and so forth, the costs are going to go with Absolutely. it. Yes. And sometimes it's, it's hard to stomach yeah, that. It's hard know? to swallow for them. Well, and I think it's, you know, the difficulty there as well is that it's really out of your control. You have to follow a specific set of guidelines and regulatory uh We'll say regulatory codes that are put in place. Mm -hmm. So it's out of your control and out of your control that the cost is going to be what it is in order to follow those codes. Yeah, exactly. Um, so it's it's definitely going to be interesting to see with these weather phenomenons getting stronger and stronger. I mean, we saw it with Ian. That was really a, the 100-year storm that seems to be occurring now every two to three years and how that's going to evolve. Um, and how do you think that's going to affect your guys' relationship as it pertains to your two companies and following, as you said, the interpretations as new people start working for these different entities, government entities? How do you think it's going to affect your guys' relationship as it pertains to following these codes very closely? Well, I think our relationship will continue to grow because we're, you know, we're kind of on the cutting edge and kind of superior architect and contractor to, you know, some of the other kind of road-sized truck contractors that mm -hmm. you see in town. Um, yes, yeah, so you can always get everything done cheaper. Of course. But is that really what you want, where you live, where you, you know, raise your family? Um, and I think that the two of us both create, uh, both of our companies create, um, Lots of economy to what we do. Mm -hmm. um, yes, it may be more expensive, but it's not because we charge more. It's just because because you do it right. We're yeah, we do it right, and we do it like the clients want it to be right. done. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I would echo that. There's you know, I was having a conversation with somebody the you know another another builder in town the other day about. Um, pricing and, and these types of things, really, and, and the the price of a project is is a byproduct of 
uh, the design of the home, how it's engineered, and the finishes that the client puts in. You know, we can't right. magically uh, procure materials at a at a lower rate than any other of contractor. Course. You know, we're we're you know typically buying out materials and subcontracts and and labor for you know very similar price compared to the next guy. You know, for us, it's important that um, you know the home is very well understood during the pricing process, and so that is very easy while working with DSDG because we're working with them through schematic design and design development and ultimately into construction documents where, um, you know, we've got a process of our own where we begin to kind of virtually construct the home uh, during that phase. And so we have a understanding of how parts and pieces are going to go together, Mm -hmm. um, how they're going to affect finishes and these types of things. And so, you know, for us, when we look at different materials, whether it's um, whether it's different upgrades that can provide um, added value as far as hurricane resistance or or even different finishes that can provide value, having the ability to show those things very clearly to a client and to quantify those things very clearly and to educate our clients on, you know, what exactly they're getting really gives them the decision of whether they see value in it or not, mm-hmm. you know. And so, um you know, as, as Mark said, I, I truly believe that the relationship that we have is is superior in the sense that both of us are are looking to provide our clients ultimately with value and not just to get a project done or to have another right. have another project in the portfolio. That the relationship, I believe, uh, for both of our firms with our client at the end of the day is is what's most important. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, my father always told me, you know, it's it's your job as a builder to educate your clients and make them understand, you know, what it is. You know, whether it's I love that. whether it's more uh, whether it's whether it's beefier components structurally for hurricane resistance or, um, you know, uh, talking to a client about whether they want to wire their house with 12 gauge rather than 14 gauge, you know, letting them make those decisions and educating them so that they can make a smart decision is, is what is important. So can we talk a little bit about that, the process that uh, Trinity takes when a prospective client comes to your office and you guys are getting down the road of, you know, this is my project, this is what I'd like to accomplish. How does that education take place? You know, how run me through a little bit of a, we'll say a top level overview of client comes in, they want to be educated on a component they don't have too much education on and your role is to educate them specifically on, maybe it's a, again, a hurricane related concern, for example. So our our sales process is um, a little unique, I believe, in how we operate. We're we're typically not starting right off the bat with scheduling home tours and walking clients through you know past homes that we've built and 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 not really looking at photos. We really want to understand who our client is first to understand um, where they're building, what kind of home they want to build, what their timeline is, what their potential budget is, um, and our sales process really focuses on what our what our actual processes and procedures are for building so that we can let them know that um, we do have a process in place. There is a method to our madness. There are safeguards in place and we've got uh, guidelines that we follow um, and really kind of show them the whole process, you know, the the organizational component of it, the, the transparency portion of it. Um, and then, you know, our 3D modeling portion that mm-hmm. we can show them how we really truly, you know, try to understand their project as, as well as possible. But um, to really answer your question, I had a, I had a potential client call me last week and they've got a home on Venice Island right on the water. And, um, you know, their question was, do we, do we tear the house or do we, do we renovate the home or do we tear the house, do we tear the house down? And, uh, you know, for me, these homes are, are, are big investments for our clients. And really, you know, you need to take that in consideration. Um, it's high on the list. And so, you know, we started evaluating the property. We realized he's about six foot in AVD, which is about, you know, kind of layman's terms, kind of six foot above sea level at low tide. Um, the flood zone that, uh, that they were in is an AE 10, uh, which means that that if um, if a catastrophic storm were to take or direct uh, or make landfall, you know, in or near the home, they could expect uh, potentially, you know, ten foot of uh, storm surge, and uh, so that's basically four foot of water on top of their right. existing property. So they have four foot of water in the house, and uh, you know, the question he said was, you know, so you know, here's here's the budget that I'd like to put into it. My conversation with him was, you know. It seems kind of wasteful, but if you were to invest money into that home via a renovation, you're obviously subject to the 50% rule, right. um, which has a lot of different nuances about it that um, you know a lot of people are kind of know but aren't completely aware of it. Um, and you know can what's going to happen there? Sorry to interrupt, yeah. Mike. Can you maybe touch on that just a little bit and go into detail for those that might be watching? Yeah, absolutely. Aware we, of that rule? you know, I get probably five to 10 phone calls a year from clients that have purchased homes in flood zones. Those homes happen to be non-conforming. They've got big renovation plans and, you know, the client's contacting me about a renovation and I've got to be the bearer of bad news to let them know that, 
hey, you really can't do what you envisioned or want to do to that home because there are restrictions. And, um, you know, I think there's some education that needs to occur in and around the uh, real estate community uh, because I feel like some agents are doing their clients a disservice by not being up to speed on those things. But realistically, the 50% rule means that if you're in an AE10 flood zone, um, and your the the elevation of the slab of your home, the first living level, um, is not at eleven feet, then your home is non-conforming because you need to be a full one foot higher than whatever the flood zone is, which makes sense because if you're going to get a flood that comes in, uh, you want to make sure that you know everything inside the home is not going to be wet, right? So if you're an AE ten, your home needs to be at eleven foot. If you're anything less than eleven foot in that particular flood zone, then your home is considered non-conforming, which means that you're subject to the 50% rule. And the 50% rule states that you are only allowed to improve or renovate a home uh, by a maximum of 50% of the stated replacement value of the structure. So you could buy a a $2 million property that might have a market value of $2 million, but the home might have been built in 1963 and may have a replacement value of $500,000. You know, there are some nuances like in the in, in the county, you're allowed to add 20 percent for depreciation for whatever. So say the home was worth five hundred thousand dollars. You could you could add 20 percent to that and then divide that amount by two. And that's what you're allowed to invest into the property now. um you know, landscaping, pools, detached structures don't really play into that. But most of the times with building costs, what they are, you know, the $200,000 or whatever it may be that you're left with to, to, to renovate, renovate that property is not really going to net most of our clients what they're, you know, what they're right. looking to do. And so sometimes private appraisals are available, which will kind of up that number a little bit. If you go that route, depreciation is not available. So say a private appraiser comes in and values the property at $700,000, well, then you've got $350,000 to work with. The, you know, the issue with that is this, is a lot of buyers are starting to become aware of this situation. And what we're seeing is most homes that are non-conforming typically only trade for dirt value on the market. So right. if you have a home that you purchased, you're looking at renovating, this kind of ties into the conversation I was having with the gentleman in Venice. You know, what I told him, as I said, you know, you're you're into the property for approximately 1.5. It's It's got a market value right now of around 2.5 because of the time you bought it and what the market's done since then. And, you know, my, you know, my recommendation to him was, whatever value you put into this home or whatever investment you put into this home from this point forward, if you're not going to elevate the home and bring the home into a conforming status, you're basically throwing money away because whoever buys the home after you is not going to see that value. value. It's only going to sell for dirt value. And, you know, he was extremely thankful for the amount of time that I spent with him guiding him through all these things. I said, listen, you know, like really you've got two plays here, you know, put a little bit of money in it, um, renovate it, you know, turn it into an Airbnb, turn it into a, a, a long-term rental property, you know, uh, uh, make sure you're getting some, some income on that. And then when the time is right, tear the house down and build a right. new one. Um, you know, I talked to a lot of clients or I talked to a lot of people who aren't necessarily aware of the different uh, flood zones and different things that we've challenges that we've got to deal with here as, as builders and architects. And, you know, people will say, you know, um, respectfully, they'll say, you know, but ignorantly, they'll say, you know, I think it's very wasteful that they're tearing that house yeah. down. And the fact of the matter is, is, you know, really the choice. building codes and <clears throat> FEMA doesn't, doesn't really allow you many options. It's right. not that we want, it's not what we want to, you know, but, um, there are some there are some uh, exceptions to the rule, like historic properties. You can seek to get a historic designation on a property, which will take you out of the restrictions of the uh, the fifty percent rule. But again, you know, good that luck comes with its own nuances as well. Good luck getting that insured and, and that type right. of thing, you know. So, um, but yeah, you know, fifty percent rule does you know have play you know a very large part in whether a home is a good candidate for renovation or not. And you know, we always seek to educate our clients on. If you are willing to invest the money into this home, you need to be willing to walk away from that money because right. I don't think that you're going to get that money back right. when you go to sell it. Well, and I think it's you, you bring up a really good point when you talked about real estate agents and the the disservice that they're doing to their clients by not educating them because it's something that we've seen pretty frequently where – when a buyer, you know, closes on the transaction, they officially own the property. It's an older house right on the water. They're wanting to do those renovations. Their assumption is that that 50% rule is 50% of the purchase.
purchase price and not 50% of the replacement cost of the structure. If that's itself. even their assumption at all, if, if, if that's even been explained to right, them. Right. And that's, and that's already, right? you know, we'll say one step in, not necessarily in the right direction, but it's one step closer to having education. Unfortunately, it's not the right way to approach it because that's not what the law dictates. Right. You know, and every time, you know, I, I'll get, I'll get phone calls from, from real estate agents as well as, um, as well as, uh, uh, buyers who've just closed in a home. And so every time I get an opportunity to talk to an agent where they say, Hey, I've got a client that's looking this home. They want to do some renovations to it before we put an offer on it or before our, before we, we go to a hard date, you know, on our contract, I'd, I'd like to do some due diligence. Can you come out? And so that's a really good opportunity for us to kind of explain the process. And right. so I'm, I'm very willing and, and happy to, um, really dive into those nuances with them to help them from making a, a you know, a financial mistake, right. um, you know, and at least give them, at least give them all of the pieces to the puzzle so they can make an educated decision because we still have clients that, that say, Hey, listen, I really appreciate you explaining all this to me. But the fact of the matter is, is, you know, it doesn't really matter to me, you know, whether I lose that money, I, I want what I want and this right. is what I want. And, and so that's no problem, but I never want to get into a situation where we, where we renovate a home. We're not up front. We don't educate our client. They go to sell the property and, and, you know, five, 10 years down the road and they take a loss and they're calling me up going, Hey, right. How come you didn't fill me in on this? You well, know, I never want to be in that position. That's why you're not making you, friends there. Exactly, especially in a town like this. And I think that's where both of you have built your businesses in the most brilliant way. It's the primarily word of mouth. You have satisfied clients. You're satisfied clients to talk to other prospective clients, who then turn into clients. And I know this this whole side of it may not be as um, as relevant mm-hmm. for you, Mark, since typically somebody is going to come to you and say, "I've got the property." can't do anything with this 50% rule. I'd like to tear it down. What can you design for me? Well, I get the same conversations Mike does. And um, I've even gone outside the box to to provide seminars for realtors to educate them on the 50% rule. That's awesome. I've gone to their office and told them about it. And most of them, i say 50% of them didn't even know it existed. Mm-hmm. So um, – I think it's a liability for those realtors that don't educate their clients mm-hmm. on the 50% rule. So they should know what it is and how to explain it to the client, right. especially when the client's talking about, yeah, I'm going to buy this house and I'm going to renovate it and add on to it. There's plenty of land. And nobody tells them that right. they do have their hands tied. Right Now, like Mike said, there's there's things we could do. Um, you know, if the structure the the structure is small and the property is big, we can always build a new structure that's mm-hmm. completely compliant, and then create a um, mm-hmm. physical disconnect between the new structure mm-hmm. and the old structure, so that you could save the old structure. But not every lot has that convenience right, or luxury. Right. right. Most lots we work on are you know, if we're lucky, a hundred feet wide. Right. You know, sometimes we get get those bigger wall, bigger lots that have some, some flexibility for us. Right. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much for both being here. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks right. for having us. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Anytime. Mm-hmm.